Okay, so for today, we have Ian Moss speaking. Um, we asked Ian if he would give uh, a bit of an introduction to false vacuum decay, uh, sort of kick us off with that, um, as, as well as some, some of his own work. Ian's a professor of theoretical cosmology in Newcastle University, and he's made all kinds of contributions to, to this, this field over the years, uh, starting from uh, the Hawking Moss Instanton, which bears his name, um, followed by work on effective actions and gravitational instantons, and then on vacuum decay seeded by a black hole. And more recently, he's been working on analog systems to experimentally observe vacuum decay. And today he'll be talking to us about well, the hot big bang in a cold gas. Um, yeah, uh, Ian, do you have any preference about how to take questions? In principle, you can just uh, raise your hand or type in the chat or, yeah, do. Uh, I'll leave uh, it to you, Ian. Take, take it away. Why don't we just let people just interrupt? And, and if it gets out of hand, I can just say, uh, maybe maybe stop interrupting. Great. Uh, yeah. yeah, please take it. Um, let's see. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yes. Good. Okay. Well, uh, thanks, Oliver. It's it's. Uh, th thank you for the opportunity to to talk and kick off, kick off this seminar series. Um, as you say, I, 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 false vacuum decay is a subject I've been interested in for many years, and it's it's sort of become uh, topical again. I, I, I think there's been some exciting developments, or at least hopes for the future. Um, so it's 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 it's. I think it's an exciting time to be to be looking at this field uh, for the first time. Uh, younger people, or uh, again for some of us older people. So I'm going to talk. Oh, by the way, I just should, should say, uh, uh, although I'm talking from Newcastle University, I'm part of a consortium called the the Quantum Hughes MFP Consortium. Um, so a, a group of us are, are working together on um, uh, analog systems and looking at analogs of false vacuum decay, which is one of the things I'm going to talk about today. Although it will be the experiment I'll talk about today is one that's done uh, by Italian colleagues. And as Oliver said, I'll 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 give some of the the very basic uh, introduction to the theory of, of false vacuum decay or tunneling through a, a barrier in quantum field theory. Um, uh, but then I, I what I would really want to do is talk about some exciting new um, observations or experiments that have been conducted uh, by colleagues in uh, in Trento, which in some ways certainly is uh, the first observation of false vacuum decay in the laboratory, and I'll hope to convince you that uh, that statement is not uh, overplaying it. Well, I, and I should start with an apology as well. Um, like Oliver said, the field uh, has been uh, tr trunging along since 1977. Uh, the literature is vast, so I apologize to uh, the people whose work I, I don't cite because uh, I really can't be very complete in, in in the citations here, so I'm sorry if I don't if I don't cite your work. Um, so let's start with the idea of bubble nucleation uh, in sort of uh, fluids and gases. Um, so you have phase transitions where you you can super cool you can cool into a metastable state, and the metastable state may decay through uh, creating nuclei of, uh, of fluid of bubbles or even crystals in the fluid. And this is characteristic of, for example, a first order phase transition. It happens to be uh, a feature of, of a very um, familiar system, which is uh, water. We can get uh, first order phase transitions. We can super, it's possible to supercool steam. And, uh, uh, and then a phase transition to the liquid phase can take place through the formation of little droplets. Or you can supercool water. And the transition to the crystalline phase can take place through the formation of little ice crystals. Um, so this is the uh, I, I'm going to call all all of these kind of phenomena sort of bubble nucleation phenomena. You could even have a a supersaturated gas in a liquid, for example, a, a glass of champagne. The gas can come out of solution in the form of little bubbles, uh, which make it champagne. Uh, an interesting system. Uh, it turns out that volcanologists, some volcanologists uh, have looked at bubbles forming in lava coming out of volcanoes. The lava can boil 
and the formation of bubbles can, can have a big effect on the viscosity of the lava, and that has a big effect on, on how the, the volcanic eruption takes place. So there's a whole lot of uh, situations where we get this sort of formation of bubbles. Um, and all of it can be described by a fairly simple physical mechanism that I'm going to talk about now. So um, oops. Um, before I go on to talk about the mechanism, I should say, um, the main uh, topic of this series of lectures is, uh, is the one of um, barrier penetration in quantum field theory, or bubbles in quantum field theory. So um, a similar phenomena to what we have in a gas can happen in a quantum field theory. And one of the main applications of this may be to early universe cosmology. In the standard model of cosmology, the universe underwent a certain number of phase transitions. Uh, for example, a quark hadron transition, electric transition, maybe grand unified theory transition. And in the standard model of particle physics, all these transitions are of second order like behavior. Um, but if you go beyond the standard model, you can easily see scenarios where these phase transitions will become first order and you'll form bubbles. Now, people are interested in this, even though it's not standard model physics per se, um, because the formation of bubbles would lead to all sorts of observational, possibly observational effects, like the creation of primordial uh, gravitational waves. Um, barogenesis can take place on bubble walls. Uh, bubbles could collide or collapse to form primordial black holes. And if you go back um, even further back to very early universe, the universe itself could have formed as a some kind of um, bubble nucleation event. And there may be other universes in their own little bubbles. And this sort of picture is what we often call the, 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 the metaverse. Do we call it the metaverse? I'm again confused with Google there. Um, so uh, we can have bubble universes and we can even have uh, uh, the universe coming into existence through the, through a, the nucleation of some kind of bubble um, uh, and then nucleating into some kind of inflationary universe phase. Um, so bubbles may be uh, quite important aspects of early universe cosmology. And as I was hinting, um, all of these phenomena can be described by a, a fairly simple physical argument. Uh, critical nucleation theory goes back to Josiah Gibbs in 1878, it turns out. Um, the idea of a, a critical bubbles forming in a metastable state uh, goes back to uh, 1878. So the idea here is that we start off with a metastable state, and then in this metastable state, we form some kind of nucleus, some kind of uh, bubble or crystal um, uh, of, of the new lower temperature, more stable phase. The probability of forming a, a nucleation site like this is proportional to the number of mi microstates in that, in that uh, nucleation site. And of course, that's just uh, the number of microstates is just exponential of the uh, entropy associated with the formation of this of this bubble on nucleation site. Um, now, it's possible to re to relate the uh, entropy in this nucleation or, or this bubble event um, to the work you have to do in order to create this bubble. So the entropy is just related to the the work you do, which I'm just writing as the energy here uh, divided by the uh, temperature. Uh, the fluctuation um, in, in involves a, a reduction in entropy. That's why it's a fluctuation and not a sort of an equilibrium event. Um, so, so we have this idea that the probability of forming these nucleation sites is given by this exponential of this, this change in entropy. Um, now, if we just consider a spherical bubble, the uh, work required or the energy required to produce the bubble um, has two parts. It has a, a surface part, depending on the surface tension, and it has a volume part, which involves a reduction in the energy density because we're going to a more favored phase. So it's possible to write the energy or the work done in terms of a surface and a, and a volume term. And if we plot the energy required as a function of the radius, we find there's a, there's a maximum, that's some value, which is called a critical radius. So the idea is, is that these fluctuations in the metastable state are described by this probability distribution, this exponential term, up to radius, this, this critical radius. Beyond it, it doesn't really make sense. And if a small nucleation, if a small nucleation event takes place that's smaller than the critical radius, um, it's favorable for it just to collapse. Um, however, if you form a, a nucleation site at the critical radius, that, that nucleation site can then grow 
and the phase transition can complete by the growth and, and merging of these different bubble nucleation events. In fact, in Frankel's uh, book in 1947, um, I think Frankel's book is the first one where I've seen this, this prefactor. He uses a thermodynamic argument to, to say what the prefactor is in front of this exponential term. Uh, Frankel describes this critical bubble as like a, a newborn baby uh, with a capacity to grow. Um, most people are familiar with this argument, though, from, uh, from uh, Lifshitz and Petiesky's statistical physics volume, um, which, is, which was first written in, in the 1930s. So the idea then uh, is that in a, in, a, in a gas or a liquid, um, a first order phase transition takes place through the nucleation of bubbles or crystals uh, of, of, of critical radius. Now, in quantum field theory, the analogous process is what we call false vacuum decay. So we replace the bubble now by solution of the field equations, but we take the time to be imaginary. We multiply the time by, by a square root of minus one. So the finite temperature bubble, uh, the, 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 the finite temperature effect I've just talked about corresponds to a to a uh, an instant of a, a, a bubble about its instant on solution, which is just dependent on space and independent of imaginary time. Now, in uh, quantum field theory, when we do finite temperature quantum field theory, we, we periodically identify the imaginary time coordinate with a period of roughly one over the temperature. So if the temperature is very low, it becomes possible to form bounce instantons, which depend on imaginary time. And the, the, the favorable ones would actually be symmetric under rotation in imaginary time and space. Um, so as the temperature goes to zero, the transition would take place through the nucleation of these bone instantons, uh, which depend on space and time. And, and then we call this process false vacuum decay. And it's a process that was considered uh, in detail, uh, most clearly, I think, by uh, Coleman uh, in his, his famous paper of 1977 and the follow-up paper with Cowan and Coleman. Um, uh, Actually, a little bit later than Coleman, uh, Lindy described the false the the, the false vacuum decay at finite temperature. Uh, 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 well, you, you, Lindy introduced this phase false vacuum decay at finite temperature for the, for the finite temperature analog. So that's the one that looks like the critical nucleation theory, and the the results of Coleman's theory agrees with the critical nucleation theory that, that I just mentioned. So false vacuum decay and false vacuum decay at finite temperature are both very interesting phenomena. Um, that may have taken place in the early universe. False vacuum decay at finite temperature may be electric phase transition, and the false vacuum decay at zero temperature could be a feature of, for example, the very early inflationary universe phase of the universe. Um, I, sh I should, I didn't say anything about this, but in, in quantum field theory, we would have some kind of potential, and the metastable phase would correspond to a local minimum of the potential, which we call the false vacuum. And the global minimum of the potential uh, would have some value of the field that we call the, the true vacuum uh, value of the field. And Coleman in this famous paper gave a, a detailed argument that gave the decay rate, the production rate of these nucleation sites uh, per unit volume, per unit time. And here's Coleman's uh, famous formula. Um, let's see, I'll... Uh, I'll start with the, the, the factor in front, uh, in front of the exponential. Um, the prefactor consists of uh, two terms. Um, one in, involves the product of the eigenvalues of the fluctuation operator. So here, okay, I, I've, I've written down the action of the theory as S subscript E to denote the fact that we've got imaginary time. I've denoted the field by, by this var phi variable. S double primed means a second functional derivative of the action which um, is the fluctuation operator. And we can think of fluctuations about the bounce, about the bounce instantons or fluctuations about the false vacuum. The determinant of the fluctuation operator is a product of the eigenvalues of the fluctuation operator. There are some zero eigenvalues corresponding to translations of the bounce instanton. And these are omitted from the determinant that's denoted by a, a prime. And these uh, excluded zero modes give rise to uh, another factor in the prefactor, which, which can be rewritten in terms of the uh, classical action of, of, of the, uh, the bounce solution. And then the term um, 
that corresponds to the uh, the exponential of the entropy is this e to the minus the uh, Euclidean action of the bounce instanton. Um, so this formula, you know, it's, it's still in use today. It's very important if we want to try and look at early universe phase transitions, for example. So um, I've written a lot of things in red at the bottom here. Uh, so I'm going to try and uh, mention some of the open questions that are very much active areas of research. So I'll start at the right. Um, first question is, um, does the bounce instanton solution exist? Do the uh, field equations have a solution? And this takes me back to the early 1980s because it turns out if you take a, a small potential barrier and you look at bubbles nucleating in De Sitter space, um, you find that there aren't any bubble uh, solutions. And yet you have a local minimum in the potential. Um, so back in the early 1980s, we, we proposed that in this situation, you have to take a homogeneous solution. And this uh, bubble instanton then, would we claim would represent the, the origin of the universe as a quantum nucleation event. And using uh, Vilenkin's phrase, a quantum nucleation event from nothing. <laughs> Uh, this is still a quite controversial interpretation of this particular instant on. But there are, there are many, even in flat space, there are many potentials for which there aren't any um, bounce solutions. And so that's an active area of research, uh, trying to see what happens in those situations. Sometimes you might find a reasonable looking bounce instant on, but it's actually got a singularity, a simple, maybe conical singularity. And this is what happens if you look at nucleation seeded by a black hole, for example. And we tried to argue that even in that case, it actually makes sense to use this, uh, this singular instant on, if you're very, very careful. Let's move along to um, the action. In Coleman's original argument, the action was the classical action of the uh, bounce solution. It really makes more sense to start putting some of the vacuum polarization or thermal corrections into this action. And then, because if you look at the prefactor, that's got uh, these determinants, which are really like um, vacuum polarization effects already. So the question arises, you know, how do I distribute these, um, these vacuum polarization effects between the exponential and between the prefactor? So that's very much uh, an active area of, of research at the moment. Um, you know, how do you put in the vacuum polarization effects and where do you put them? And probably how do you split them up? Um, if we move to the left, um, the prefactor usually could be evaluated numerically, um, but it's infinite. So you've got to regularize it. Um, evaluating something numerically that's being regularized is a, a, a bit of a problem in itself. Uh, um, however, and, and, and besides being difficult, you have, you have to make sure that you're getting convergence and, uh, and results that behave sensibly on the, uh, by the cutoff scale. So that, again, is very much an active area of research at the moment. If I move to the left, um, I think there's less attention paid to uh, some issues about what we actually mean by the nucleation rate. So first of all, it's nucleation rate per unit area per unit time. So a finite temperature, does that mean we nucleate in the rest frame of the uh, thermal system of the gas? At zero temperature, there's no preferred frame. What on earth does that mean? Another way of putting this is, when the bubbles nucleate, do they nucleate at zero velocity? Is there some velocity distribution? That's an interesting question that's only recently, I think, been tackled by uh, Matt Johnson and his, his student, uh, Dalila. Uh, they, they've got some interesting results, particularly at finite temperature on uh, the, the probability di uh, distribution of the velocity of the bubbles. There's also a question of uh, correlations. Uh, Coleman's argument just really applied to an isolated bubble. Uh, bubble nucleation events correlated. Are the uh, bubble when the bubble nucleates, it grows. Um, does it grow as a classical object, or are the fluctuations in the wall of the bubble are those important? When are those important? Um, I think a lot of interesting questions here, which are, 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 are well, they are active areas of research, but there's still many, many, many open questions. There's another question here. Um, uh, we are, I'm assuming, we're assuming here that these, these bounce instantons dominate the uh, vacuum decay process, but do they? I mean, there might be some other process that dominates the, the vacuum decay process. Um, and here, yeah, I'd, I'd just like to stress that there's a big difference between quantum field theory and quantum mechanics of single particles. 
in the case of quantum mechanics of single particles, if you have initial state with energy less than the barrier height, then there's no classical way for that, for, for there's no classical way for the particle to get through the barrier. There has to be some kind of quantum tunneling event. In quantum field theory, I could have initial condition in which the field was fairly uniform with little fluctuations, but somehow all the flux was towards the middle. And so at a later time, I might, I might have enough energy connecting into some small area to form the critical bubble by a purely classical process. So this is a peculiar feature of quantum field theory. We may have classical ways of, of getting uh, the, the, these critical nucleation events. And in fact, there is something like this seen in, in finite temperature um, decays. There's, there's a fair bit of work on classical solutions called oscillons. And then the question arises, does Coleman's result for the, for the vacuum decay of finite temperature include the effects of the oscillons somehow? Or do we have to treat them separately? I mean, does an oscillon somehow increase the nucleation rate? Uh, or is it already taken into account? I, and I, I mean, I'm, maybe people in the audience know the answer to this question, but it's something, uh, uh, something that troubles me. So I'm trying to shake your faith in, in Coleman's result, right? Uh, is it right? Uh, I think maybe we ought to uh, you know, check it. It's a long time since 1977. Uh, very few of us uh, were alive back in 1977. Maybe we should revisit these questions and ask, you know, can we really confirm whether this, 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 this result is correct? So one thing we can do is, is look at a completely different approach. Let's, we can look at the real-time evolution approach. Um, there's been a lot of work um, in the last couple of decades on uh, looking at uh, classical evolution in quantum field theory systems, particularly electroweak phase transition systems. And a lot of this is, is assuming Coleman's result and nucleate, putting bubbles in at random, putting bubbles into initial conditions and see how they evolve. This is tremendously important if we want to see um, how many gravitational waves are produced, uh, if we can produce or, de or destroy barrier genesis um, during the uh, electric phase transition. So a lot of work on real-time approaches uh, already assumes uh, Coleman's result. It'd be kind of nice to have um, approaches which don't assume Coleman's result, and there are such things. So. Uh, one way is to introduce stochastic sources into uh, the classical field equations. This You can sort of justify this uh, semi-rigorously. The idea is that um, small-scale thermal fluctuations can be, the, can be dominating the large-scale, can be feeding back to the large-scale behavior, and these can be more important than the quantum uh, fluctuations. And in this, sense, in this case, you can actually show you can integrate out the small-scale stuff and end up with a Langevin equation that is a, a classical field equation with, a, with a, a, a random source. And dissipation comes into this as well. Um, this can be justified at high temperature. However, most applications are done at lower temperatures than, than can really be justified, because we'd like to know about phase transitions, we'd like to know about um, bubble nucleation, and typically we're looking at small, not small, but not high temperatures. Um, but so far, this has been very promising. Um, <clears throat> it's possible to see bubble nucleation events in these stochastic equations. And there seems to be reasonably good agreement between the nucleation rate um, in these simulations and the nucleation rate produced by Coleman's formula. So that's good. Um, but we're tending to use these equations in regimes where they're not, strictly speaking, uh, very good approximations. Um, another. Uh, there's, there's been more recent work on something called truncated Wigner, which comes from the atomic physics community. Um, so in this in truncated Wigner approach, you draw initial con you just draw the initial conditions from a random distribution, and then you evolve classically. The truncated refers to the fact that you evolve classically, that is using classical field equations. I, 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 it may be possible to show that this could be exact if instead of evolving classically, we evolve using the quantum effective field equations. Um, but to do this properly, we'd have to calculate the quantum effective field equations on the um, evolving background. 
so it's 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 not easy to do so that so it's natural to just try and use a classical field equations or some simply co corrected uh field equations um so this has been uh uh stolen or, or taken up recently um i think the first application i know to quantum field theory relativistic quantum field theory was uh, uh, braden johnson Pyrrhus, sponsor and mike fechner um, but we've been using it in these analog systems quite a lot. Um, this, the, the, this approach is used very widely in atomic physics. Um, so far, we've not managed to get good agreement between truncated Wigner and the instanton formula. So there's a big open question here. Um, we don't know, is this because we should be using better equations? That is, we should be, use, we should be correcting um, the uh, action both in the nucleation formula and in the evolution equations, or is just is 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 there just some some basic failure in the truncated Wigner approach? So that's very much an open question uh, uh, at the moment. I, 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 that's a question I'd, I'd very much like to to see some progress on. Um, I think I have time just to show a couple of simulations. Um, so these uh, these just these are just Newcastle ones based on. Uh, on atomic physics is a question. I, I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> I'll just point out it's kind of slightly goes in the, in the second category, but there are also these lattice simulations pioneered by Guy Moore and just Schramberg and Kai Homokainen, which use a combination uh -huh. of lattice simulations to create critical bubbles and do some things in a classical or or or, or lattice based to, to see them in the or not, which kind of falls into a second category, but not quite. Um, so I thought it was worth pointing out as well. Yeah, no, thanks. That, that that's very useful. Uh, it's a bit confusing because my colleagues use 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 lattice approaches to mean truncated Wigner. Um, <laughs> so yeah, there, there there are lattice approaches and lattice approaches. Okay. Um, here's some um, here's a truncated Wigner a stochastic uh, simulation. Uh, one of the left is truncated Wigner. Um, nothing's happening because uh, we're waiting for some bubbles to nucleate. Uh, this is done by Tom Billum and Kate. Uh, no, it's just Tom Billum and uh, yeah, Tom Billum did the Ebonics here. This is a hundred different simulations uh, in a periodic uh, grid, and in each one there is a bubble nucleating and growing. So we can use uh, these simulations to calculate a, a, a decay rate. Uh, I mean the. They look very much like what you'd expect from a nuclear. That as you see, bu bubbles nucleating at a critical size and growing to 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 complete a phase transition. Uh, the rates, though, are not agreeing with the nucleation formula so far. Another picture. Um, this is this goes very quickly. <laughs> this is a, a thermal simulation. Um, again, we get a critical instanton forming. Can I replay that? No. You get a critical instant on forming, and then it grows and just fills the space. Um, so when, when you do these simulations, you get something that looks very much like. Um, oh, let's see if we can stop that. Okay, no. Uh, you get something that looks very much like what you expect. You see these bubbles nucleate with a certain size. New features, though, you get uh, the bubbles are often slightly lopsided. Um, the you, you see the the edges a bit fuzzy, and. Um, you know, the, whether this is relevant for electric phase transition, make the different parameter ranges. Um, not not least the fact that electric phase transition probably takes place at, um, what, 200 GeV. Um, these transitions in atomic gases would take place at uh, 20 nanokelvin. Uh, <laughs> a bit of a difference in uh, range. But that does uh, bring us on to the next thing, uh, which is... Um, as observational uh, observations of false vacuum decay in the laboratory. Um, so um, we have, I think, the first uh, demonstration of false vacuum decay in, in a field theory system uh, in a laboratory setting. But this, I should stress, is false vacuum decay at finite temperature. So this experiment is done in Trento by the Trento group, uh, led by Gabriele Ferrari. Um, in this system, it's 1D, so I'm afraid the bubbles don't look very exciting. Um, this is a sodium bose Einstein condensate. Um, the system is put into two uh, Zeeman levels, that is, the magnetic field splits some of the levels. Um, these are hyperfine split levels, so it's, it's like you have a two level system. 
um, the the uh, these two levels are, are they are they are in the cost to interact uh, by applying a radio frequency beam. The amplitude of this beam is gives us a parameter omega, and the frequency gives us a parameter delta. And the thing is about these parameters, we can tune them. So the first one is called the Rabi, the, 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 the Rabi frequency, and the other one's got just the detuning frequency. But we can we can tune these. Uh, there are also uh, some parameters that depend on scattering between these states, which we can't tune, um, on, but they have to have satisfy a certain relation in order for the ground state to be ferromagnetic. That is, um, <laughs> if all the two states up and down, uh, the ferromagnetic ground state is where all this, all the all the uh, all, all these atoms are in the up or the down state. Up or down here, meaning um, the, these two Zeeman levels. Um, so, oh, here are the observations. This is real data. Um, so the top picture shows some runs. Uh, horizontal axis is time. Vertical axis is, is the distance along this BEC. Um, the bottom sort of indicate what happens. So at time D equals T equals zero, the system's put into a stable state. And then the parameters are changed, so that stable state becomes unstable. So at t equals zero, that state becomes unstable. After a while, the bubble nucleates, uh, the bubble grows, and then at some point, the experiment is stopped and the width of the bubble, size of the bubble is measured. A feature of this system, like many BEC systems, is that you can't make real-time measurements. You can only make one measurement and then you destroy the system. So you have to do lots of runs and you, you make measurements at different times and just look at the statistics of uh, you know how big a bubble do you have at that time. So in this picture, I think there are eight, there are eight runs at different times. The early runs are all blue, which is the metastable state. Um, the next run, you see there's one run that's got a bubble in it, seven that don't. And as you move along, you see there are more and more bubbles and bigger, bigger bubbles. So there's we can see how the bubbles are nucleating and growing, even though we can't actually have a movie of what's going on as a function of time. But we can from this information, we can measure nucleation rates in this system. When I say this system, um, there's an effective theory. Um, the uh, it's possible just to integrate in the transverse direction and just consider this as a one-dimensional system. The parameter of interest is a magnetization. That's the up minus the down, the, the relative amount of up and down states. And it's possible to show that uh, there's an effective theory with a potential um, that's a function of the magnetization and has the, the classic double well form with a false vacuum at some value of the magnetization. Uh, so the nice thing is that two of the parameters in this potential of the Rabi frequency of the detuning are tunable. That, that is, you can, you can dial some knobs and, and you can change the shape of your potential. Um, so, so you can make the bar, you can change the height of the barrier, you can change the, 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 the height difference between the between the potential, between the minima. So you've got um, a very good control of the system. Uh, I, sh I should just say, uh, I, I'm, the, the experimental challenges here are, are immense. Uh, um, there's no one managed to get the, the stability of the magnetic field they need is, is beyond what other people have managed. And the times you've got to wait a long time for the bubbles to nucleate, and you've got to keep this 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 system going for, you know, a hundred milliseconds or so, which is a, a long time in BEC standards. So this is quite a remarkable experimental feat. Um, so and, anyway, we have an effective theory, um, which is a field theory, uh, which 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 we can use to describe uh, describe this system. Um, we can calculate the false vacuum decay rate. The, the vacuum rate actually is is negligible. So this is a thermal, this is a false vacuum decay at finite temperature. So the formula is actually the, well, it's, I've, I've credited Mark Einmarsh here, but actually uh, his review, um, the formula actually goes back to uh, the critical nucleation theory. Uh, it, it, it goes back uh, well over 100 years. Um, so we just have, have to work out the bounce solution, the bounce instant on solution because it's energy and substitute that <coughs> formula to get the uh, the nu bubble nucleation rate. Um, in fact, we can even approximate, we can do the integral for small barriers and get the dependence on the various on the various parameters. Um, and well, how does it comply with that experiment? Uh, you're asking, maybe not. Oh, I should say first, uh, 
we've, we've done uh, we've done real time analysis using truncated Vigna. Uh, that that uh, so Anna Bertie and um, Trent O done the truncated Vigna. Um, we've done the uh, stochastic GPE. Um, so there's a there, there is a stochastic uh, field equation. It's the equation for atomic condensate with a noise term, which is written zeta, and some damping. Um, so you can actually run this stochastic uh, GPE and actually see bubbles nucleating. So the picture at the top is supposed to you know, the, the, is a simulation of what what's seen in the experiment. But because we can run these as a movie, uh, we don't have to just stop this at a particular time. Um, uh, so the GPE produces critical it produces bubble nucleation, um, and everything agrees. So the experiment, the instanton theory, and the stochastic GPE, they all agree, modulo some conditions, I'll just say in a moment. So here's real data. Um, I haven't put the experimental error bars in because they are very big. Um, so the, the, the dots are the um, experiment, experimental results. Um, this is not rates, this is time to decay. Um, the error bars, the, the, the stochastic Gross-Pichewski equation, and the line is the instanton, the best instanton fit. Um, now, um, I'm not in the business of cal calculating these prefactors. Um, also, I'm not sure it'll be very useful in this system because it, it's, it's quite a messy system because uh, there, there are, this is an effective theory, but there's also other degrees of freedom. So what we do is we fit a two parameter fit, we fit to the prefactor and the temperature. Um, everything else is fixed. Um, now, given the data, uh, uh, two parameters, uh, um, well, <laughs> given the data, it's not so surprising that we get a two parameter fit. Uh, on the other hand, the fit is very good. And a nice feature is if, if you look at different values of one of these parameters, this Rabi frequency, <coughs> you see we can combine these. Um, so the, the, the picture on the right combines the two pictures on the left. And you see they overlay one another because we're plotting against this parameter, which is the detuning minus some offset divided by some parameter. So the data all collapses down if we use this particular parameter. Now, this particular parameter that's on the, on the horizontal axis was discovered empirically by the experimental team. But if you look at the nucleation formula at the bottom here, you'll see that it pops out naturally that the, uh, the tunneling exponent depends on this parameter, delta minus delta crit or kappa n. Um, it depends relatively weakly on the other parameters like the Rabi frequency. So you can see this collapsing of the data onto the single parameter is a feature of the of the instanton fit, <coughs> and it's why the instanton fit fits fit fits so well to the experimental data. So um, it all is pretty good. Um, give me a chance to admire the data for a minute. Um, I'll just summarize this though in in words. Um, so we've seen a, a metastable, metastable field state that uh, that lives a long time compared to the the, the length time scale of the of the experiment, and then decays by the nucleation of of these regions. I call them bubbles; they're really intervals in one dimension. Uh, nucleation time scales show an exponential dependence on the parameters. So that that alone is is indicating a non-perturbative um, um, decay process. <coughs> Good agreement between um, stochastic simulations. A thermal instanton decay rate and experiment. Some provisos, though, um, well, as already I, I said, we just fit the prefactor as an arbitrary parameter. We've, we've kept it fixed, but we've kept the same value um, uh, for the different um, values of the detuning. <coughs> um, the, 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 there's a parameter in there called delta crit. It's a point at which the barrier disappears. Um, the theory value and the value we have to put in to make everything work aren't quite the same. And this could be because of, well, I claim it's because of thermal corrections to the potential, but we don't really know. And also, um, the value of N over T is, is for the instant on the stochastic simulations, is rather smaller than what, you, what, what came out of the truncated being simulations. The experimental team claimed their temperature agrees with the truncated Vigna simulations, not with our instanton fit. So there is something uh, we don't quite understand here in, in, in terms of, of what's going on, certainly in terms of truncated Vigna simulations of, of this experiment. Um, 
so modulo that um it's 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 it seems it's modulo that there's a very good agreement with the instanton formula um it's just one of the parameters maybe the temperature we need to put in is, is rather higher than what the experimentalists are happy with um we have a micro kelvin the experimentalists think it's 300 nano kelvin um factor of three or so well 50 percent is a factor of two um uh, yeah, okay, that, 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 so that's where we are with the experiment. Um, I'd like to think where we go from here in terms of analog experiments. Um, it'd be nice to do a 2D experiment. So here's some simulations of 2D experiments. In 2D, we can look at things like bubble collisions. Um, uh, we can look at the collisions of bubbles, bubbles and how bubble wall collisions create waves. These will be uh, waves, in, in this case, in the magnetization. Um, they, they, in, in, in the early universe, these are gravitational waves, of course. Um, so here I've got another simulation of the same system, but in 2D. There's no 2D experiment yet. Um, so let's see what happens. So on the left is a magnetization, on the right is a phase. You'll see why I plot the phase in just a moment. So the bubbles nucleate. Um, they do something weird. I can ask me about that. Um, and then they collide. And uh, the phase is doing all sorts of weird things. And look what's happened. We've got these two little dots here, which are two little monopoles, uh, uh, two, two little vortices in the, um, in the BEC. So you can easily imagine that in the early universe, this would correspond to bubbles colliding and forming some kind of defect, some kind of object like a monopole. The phase there, by the way, um, goes through uh, two pi. Uh, as, as you go around each of these monopoles. So the, the phase is plotted to show that these pair really are a pair of monopoles. You can sort of see um, the phase goes through uh, red, white, and blue uh, around where the monopoles are. So um, you can look at defect formation. You can look at um, production of waves. Of course, these are just 2D systems. They would be just 2D systems, um, but they'd be a useful check of whatever theory um, you've developed to, uh, to apply to the early universe. So that's why I, can, uh, I find it's quite, quite exciting. So, um, okay, I don't like to overstay my welcome. So, uh, so, um, so we'd like to say that we've seen the first experimental demonstration of false vacuum decay at finite temperature in a Bose-Einstein condensate. Um, false vacuum decay, uh, maybe I think everybody at this meeting will, will already uh, think that false vacuum decay is a rather exciting phenomenon. Um, that could well be uh, important for understanding some early universe phenomenon. Um, and I think one thing to come out of this is that we're on the verge of seeing a whole range of vacuum, vacuum decay phenomena in the laboratory. Um, because so far, we've not seen zero temperature vacuum decay. So that's something I um, hope to see in future. Um, I'm hoping that uh, experimental colleagues in Cambridge, for example, where Zoran has a bag, she's giving us a try, uh, we'll see some uh, some zero temperature vacuum decay. We can study bu bubble de uh, collisions, defect formation, um, CD decay, uh, wave production. All of these phenomena are, are something we should be able to study in the laboratory in the relatively new future. So I think uh, you know we're, we're on the eve of uh, an interesting. Uh, time in uh, theory of false vacuum, the, well, the observation and theory of false vacuum decay. So I think that's all I have to say. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Ian. That was a great talk. Um, now we have some time for questions. Um, yeah, please put up your hand if you have a question. And while we wait, let me just start. Um, uh, it, so you've worked on a few different um, analog systems and you have these cold atom systems and then you had this ferromagnetic system, um, which is the one that it's actually been observed in. Yeah, I was I was just wondering, um, uh, are, 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 are there experiments in different places on these different systems and some going to, yeah, uh, some more promising than others. What what what's the current status of all the different possible? Yeah, analogs? yeah. I, I actually I did figure. I, I was I was hoping to put in a slide on on the current the current state of play, um, but I can just do it verbally. 
um, uh, uh, in, in Cambridge, the, there's there is a, an attempt to do a different atomic system, um, which and, and uh, what I didn't mention is uh, is is the system at Trento. Um, the effective theory is not relative, is not uh, Lorentz invariant. Um, it has some Lorentz invariant features. Uh, the dispersion relation is 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 um, is Klein Gordon dispersion relation, but it's it's not fully Lorentz invariant. The, 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 the system that's being studied at Cambridge would be Lorentz invariant, so it'd be like a, a true Klein Gordon system. So Zoran Azabazic is is trying to do something in uh, is trying to do something in um, in Cambridge. And uh, the, the the different atomic species is, is doing is doing potassium thirty nine. Um, the um, Trento system is, is sodium. Um, there's a third system which I'd like someone to try. <laughs> um, it's it's the, the, the there's there's another another system um, based on uh, on potassium, um, which which is, which has the advantage of being relativistic, but I believe much easier. Well, okay, I'm not an experimentalist. Uh, but it doesn't have some of the difficulties that uh, the Cambridge system has. So, um, so there's there's what I call a spin one system, and I'm, and I'm hoping that someone will try the spin one system. Um, the more the better. Um, I'm hoping the Trento people will have a look at bubble collisions, because um, obviously that's uh, an interesting thing they can do on their system in one D. But if they do some two D simulations, they could do two D bubble simulations. So at the moment, um, as far as I know, there, there's, there's two experimental setups looking at this, um, but there's room in there for more. Um, it's, it's difficult. You see, the, uh, the um, experimental physicists have their own agenda of things to do. And for the last decade or so, anyone looking at early universe type stuff would be looking at defect formation and in particular kibble zurek mechanism. Um, I think what we need is, is to try and persuade our experimental co colleagues that false vacuum decay is, is an interesting thing to look at and, uh, and maybe get, get more of them to try that. And, you know, if, if there gets to be a critical mass, what happens is because everybody jumps on the bandwagon and then you start to get lots of people doing it. So anyway, so far, I, I'm hoping the Trento result will create, create some interest and, 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 and encourage other experimentalists to try. Thanks for that summary, Ian. Um, we have a question from Anna Cormu. Uh, hello, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you for the very nice talk. And um, I have maybe a bit of a naive question, but um, I was just wondering, when you have these like analog systems, could you use um, the bubble methylation rate calculated based on the analog systems in the early universe physics and, for example, in gravitational wave spectra calculations, and how would one hypothetically go go about it? So um, when we do these analog systems, we try to find analog systems that have a Klein-Gordon limit. So, so they can just be described basically by, by simple Klein-Gordon theory with a double well potential. So in, in that situation, we're getting something closer to the, uh, the Higgs system. So we, we try to engineer a system that looks like the, um, as much as it can, like a particle physics system. Um, there are there are things you could do if, if for example we go to a lot of work to produce this Klein Gordon system, um, we could for example quite easily then engineer a system which instead of having one scalar field has two scalar fields. Um, in fact, the spin one system I mentioned really has two scalar fields, and and then that might look, that might look a little bit like a, a two Higgs system. Um, there, there is there is something there's some drawback to these analog systems I should mention is is that the analog system also has extra degrees of freedom. And what we try to do is work at, work at a regime where these degrees of freedom are not excited. Um, so for example, in those, I showed you some pictures of 2D bubbles in, the, in, in, in one of these systems, and the bubbles did weird things. They started to recollapse, and then the edges went all weird. And this is because the other degrees of freedom are being excited. Um, now, in electric phase transition, you've got a similar situation. So the bubbles are in the Higgs field, but the Higgs field is coupled to all sorts of other mess. So for example, as the bubble wall moves in the you know, in electric phase transition, it's interacting with stuff, with, for example, thermal fermions. And this has an effect on the bubble wall. 
So, you know, so there are complications to the analog systems. There are complications to the electric system. There are different complications, to, to be honest. On the other hand, if we can really understand the analog system, then we can perhaps have more confidence that we can understand the electric system. So I think it's really just about proving that we know what we're doing and testing that in the laboratory and then taking our knowledge to a different system, which is electric like to call the early universe system is that is that kind of answer you're looking for do you want to... yeah yeah thank you that is exactly what i <laughs> yeah i just say i can't i can't help mentioning I, um this is a feature of all analog systems you find they've all they've always got extra degrees of freedom that make life complicated so analog black hole evaporation is always more complicated than than just uh, uh hawking <laughs> black hole evaporation so it's it's also a, a, a drawback of analog systems, is that the real world systems are messy. Ato atom, atomic physics is messy. Uh, standard model physics is relatively simple. Uh, <laughs> you wouldn't believe that, but it really, it really is compared to real world physics. <laughs> Thanks, Ian. Any, any final questions? Seems maybe that's it. So um. Yeah, uh, let's thank Ian again, or thank you very much. I guess it doesn't quite work with clapping as usual, but yeah, <laughs> thank you very much for the talk. That was, that was really great. Thanks. And uh, the next talk will be on the 8th of February, and we have Sylvia Pagasia. Um, so yeah, hopefully see a lot of you then. Bye-bye. Well.